So what we've got now is the ever popular lightning talks session. So this will have uh, three different presentations uh, baked into one. And your host for that is going to be Arno van Ninaten, uh, who uh, you met yesterday. But Arno, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Alex. So welcome to the lightning talk session at the Trillion Expert Summit uh, North America. My name is Arno van Ninaten, and I'm the product manager for Trillion Sites. Uh, in the next 45 minutes, we can enjoy three different short talks about Trillion. Uh, so make sure you post your questions in the chat box during the talks, because if time permits, we will have a live Q&A at the end of all the three presentations. Uh, otherwise, uh, speakers will answer your questions in the chat box itself. Uh, so let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Velu Arjunan will share tips and tricks about how to fine tune the Trillion publisher and deployer for your specific setup. Uh, and we have a Jamstack presentation from Pankaj Gar on how and when to use JavaScript, APIs, and markup web development architecture in combination with Trillion. Uh, but we will kick off the lightning talk session uh, with Alvin Reyes, uh, who will share his experiences and learnings about conducting successful discovery sessions. So over to you, Alvin. Thanks, Arno, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining TXX for the Americas uh, day two. I'm excited to be here. Um, in this session, Lightning will start strike thrice. So let me go first, then Vela and Pankaj. The lightning bolt I'd like to leave in your brains today is to prepare you for your next discovery sessions to get more aha moments. And I'll explain what I mean by discovery and aha. My name is Alvin Reyes. Uh, as a business architect with RWS, I align things, uh, our content and translation management implementations and systems to our customers' business needs and their strategies. I've served as a consultant, project manager, business analyst, and product owner. I most enjoy understanding and interacting with our customers and partner community and uh, drawing boxes, actually. Uh, I'm back in San Diego, California, though I miss my friends and colleagues from the Amsterdam office. What kind of moment are we looking for? If you guys can guess, write something in chat, and this is an easy freebie. It's an aha moment. No, we're looking for aha moments. And if you can think of some, feel free to put some in chat for aha moments you've seen when talking to customers or working on something, uh, a project you have. So an aha moment is when the light bulb goes on, a flash of insight, or some surprising detail you learn during a discovery session. I'll offer some examples. One that happens a lot is uh, those moments when someone doesn't realize we had a particular feature in our products, for example, where used, the blueprint viewer, or the checked out items list. Or when we found a marketer mentioned they spent up to half of their time on administration within their current processes. Or perhaps a team member mentioned they spent a good deal of time uh, cropping images manually or when editors actually duplicate content by following explicit instructions to uniquely name files based on the content inside them. Or uh, one that I'm, I'm encountering more often is when ad hoc translations are not committed to translation memory. And if you don't know what that means, let's talk. Uh, some of these might be obviously interesting, but there are some practices to make your discoveries and your aha moments better in your next session. So my first tip is the icebreaker. Offer some thought-provoking hook, especially among so many online meetings. To break the, it's great to break the tension before getting started. Share a story, a picture, or both. I borrowed this slide from one of our other presentations. In our content supply chain advisory service, shameless plug, we run a kickoff meeting, a few discovery sessions, and a findings presentation to describe the as-is and to-be processes for an organization. Now that we've broken the ice, I'll jump into the three key elements I'd like to talk about to focus on your next discovery session to get more aha moments and insights. And that's to listen to gather those insights, solicit insights in a way to make your participants comfortable. You're more of a facilitator than an expert and some tips to prepare for your next session. For background, a discovery session is a customer, client, or internal meeting to learn about a topic without coming to a conclusion or decision just yet. The idea is to help diverge and learn about the possibilities before you converge to a solution. 
Uh, you might do some discovery when meeting a customer in a kickoff, um, during a customer journey workshop, jobs to be done if you're following UX practices, or the plug content supply chain advisory service by RWS. So this first element is to listen. And in my consulting and product roles, this has been challenging, especially up front, because part of our job is to create, propose, and discuss solutions. How we're doing our UX uh, customer research, uh, I've learned to kind of sit on my hands and listen, really listen. Avoid coming up with solutions on the spot or addressing customer concerns. You can address them afterwards, but not during the session. So limit solutioning upfront in any of your discovery sessions. We keep our ears open. Uh, we want to listen, dig in deep, and see how a current process works. You want to get your comf your participants comfortable. So avoid judgment. Um, you might ask why they do something, uh, but don't put a connotation on, on whether what they're doing is right or wrong. It's just the as-is process. Uh, you might ask them to talk out loud and describe pain points, um, but you'll do better by listening more. So limit what you suggest. Uh, be sure your fellow researchers and analysts avoid interrupting. They can save their questions for the end of a session and explain to your participants you're intentionally not answering. It's, it's kind of unnerving when you're talking and presenting and explaining something from the from your participant side and your facilitator isn't responding. So it's, it's, it's useful to explain that you're intentionally not trying to help or guide or, or bias your participant too much. Uh, to capture what you hear, it's great to take notes uh, live if you can pull it off. Uh, my colleague Rick Rasp also suggested active listening. So while you're taking notes and listening, um, clarify anything that's not clear. Yeah, you can do that uh, during the session. Uh, repeat what they meant and then um, uh, ask any follow up questions. So listen, take notes, clarify. And that brings me to the second point in my lightning talk. Um, soliciting. And um, also part of the listening and between listening and soliciting is the recording part has, I found has been optional. It's great to go back to recording, but in practice, and I've heard from others, if you're taking good notes and you have backup taking notes, you don't necessarily need to go back uh, to the recording or rewatch everything that you've just gone through. Um, according to a study by Linda Hinkle of Fairfield University, taking pictures of an event can actually reduce your ability to remember details about what happened. So not recording or not intentionally saving your review for the recording um, can, can help you focus in the moment while you're listening. Uh, with the notes on the recording, if you do take it, your aha moment might be later. So it's good to, again, clarify, uh, um, get on the right page and absorb what's going on in a session by listening. My next point is to solicit. So solicit is the act of asking for something from someone in case, uh, in this case, the information you need to discover. So whenever I hear on my kids' devices, like and subscribe, smash that notification bell, or when I tell someone to contact me about the content supply chain advisory service, that's soliciting. But in a professional environment, the ask of asking can be very hard. It's really hard to tell someone exactly how you're feeling, good or bad, in a professional work environment. Uh, people tend to uh, want to be helpful. They want to give an answer that you're looking for, um, especially if you ask a leading question. Um, sometimes people don't want to agree. Uh, they want to give you a hard time. And uh, sometimes people want to appear smart or geek out on a topic and get off track. So hold on, let me, let me check chat if there's anything on. Uh, anything geeky to follow up on yet? No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for this, let me give some more tips for soliciting about being real, getting real, uh, being curious, lowering the stakes of your interview, and being subtly helpful yet thought-provoking. Um, I also like to have some fun in solicitation. So getting real. So there's a difference between what someone says they do from what they actually do. And there's a difference between what you see on screen if someone's sharing and the user's full context. Uh, in our 
uh, supply chain advisory services, we focus on actual end users of the systems while using those systems. And in UX research, we found that an editor might have something like a post-it note explaining what certain selections do in their components that control website themes. Uh, but we'll also learn that if you ask and probe and, and ask nicely, uh, they'll mention they've memorized the information on the post-it note. Um, so it's not necessarily needed for their day-to-day. So you get those kind of insights when you're looking at more of the customer's full context, uh, balance against their comfort level. So if they're comfortable, they might share video so you can see their face. Um, audio is, is definitely needed. And be calm, take your time, and don't rush. The insights will come when your participants are comfortable uh, with you and the session. Uh, be curious, but stay on track. So participants will respond to your tone, interest, and curiosity. You want to ask open-ended questions. Ask what comes to mind when you see something, but definitely get back on track. Uh, a good tip from UX colleague Luke Chen is to trail off to solicit more information from your participants. So you might go after you create the content, you and your, hopefully your audience will fill in the blanks. You can also lower the stakes of the interview. Uh, UX researcher Daria and I made this mistake when one of our first research subjects for the Tridian Sites Experience Space UI felt like she was being tested. Uh, it was a little stressful. So it can help It can help to distance yourself from the thing you're investigating. Oh, let's just look at this that, that someone worked on, even if, it, even if it was you. That's another good tip from Luke. Um, so since then, we've clarified what we are testing. We are testing experience. We're looking at the, the as is. There's no right or wrong. And we are just trying to learn. Um, and it's not, it's not on the participant. They're just, they're just sharing what they do. It helps to provoke thoughts. And if you're careful, you can solicit ideas from, from a proposal or suggestion like this one. We've, I've used this to ask customers about their content uh, life cycle or content supply chain. Uh, this one's from, from Daria as well. And then participants can fill in their blanks. But you have to be careful not to lead your audience and your participants too much in a certain direction because you'll get the answers that you're looking for. And finally, for solicitation, I like to have fun and ask some thought-provoking questions. So for example, if you had a magic wand, what would you want in the system? What pains would you want to get rid of? So these can be a good source of insights, but you really need to work up to uh, this kind of question. Build that trust and rapport, come across neutral and friendly, and make your participants feel like there's nothing wrong with what they're doing, even if, it's, even if something is obviously wrong. Um, and encourage them to, to share what's going on in their minds, uh, how they're feeling. And if you can get, get your, com your audience comfortable, uh, they'll share a bit more. So let me wrap this up with a slide on a point with pre on preparation. And now I finally have bullets. So it's all images that I had to look for. Uh, set expectations up front. What's the session for? Is this research? Is this discovery? Uh, it's not a sales session. You're not troubleshooting. Um, it's not a confessional. I think RG has uh, used that one to describe how these sessions are not. Uh, who will perform what roles? So if it's just you, you have to be host, facilitator, and note taker. If you add someone, they can help you with notes while you ask the questions. You might add a subject matter expert, account representative, etc. But you also have to be careful on the roles. You'll have an active researcher, perhaps that's you, and then the gallery who are quietly observing and not, trying not to distract your participants. And you can have the gallery ask questions and offer some insights at the end, but not during your discovery session. And finally, begin with the end in mind. Arjit's reminding me about this, is that you come in with a point, like for me, I want to get lightning into your brains to improve your discovery sessions to get more aha moments. And hopefully, we came up to, with some insights here. Um, so prepare and ask those questions. You know, Bring the list of questions with you to your sessions. In our content supply chain advisory services, we recommend and provide return on investment. If you take, for example, translation review, it will improve your process like so. But in order to get there, you need to ask those questions along the way. Who works on what? How often does content go back? How do linguists review? How do editors review what the linguists uh, return? 
Um, you have to ask those questions and the details if you're going to provide something like ROI in, um, in your final findings. And finally, practice. Uh, this is something that we've learned the hard way, uh, where WebEx might not work or something might go wrong. So have a fallback, be ready to be flexible in the session and focus on what you're trying to learn. And, and you can get there by preparing, practicing a bit with the technology and you'll have a, dis a successful discovery session. Okay, hopefully that got you some small jolt to your TXS experience and day. S listen, solicit and prepare for your next discovery sessions and get to some aha moments. Feel free to continue and chat. I'll let Velo come up on stage. And I think we'll answer questions at the end, like uh, Arno probably mentioned at the beginning. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to Trading Experts Summit 2021 America's chapter. And today in this lightning talk, very quickly we talk about a new web development approach called Jamstack. Before we move, um, I give a brief uh, introduction about myself. So myself, Pankaj Gaur, I'm from Content Bloom, based out in New Delhi, India, having vast experience delivering the digital experiences through a variety of CMS, DXPs, CDPs, headless implementations. Uh, usually I play a role of a solution architect, a consultant, and a strategy builder, and have been a prestigious MVP award for six time. Uh, quickly, the agenda if you are talking about, we talk a bit about Jamstack, how it works, and how it is different from our traditional web development approach. We talk a bit about the benefits and the drawbacks. Then we see how we can apply this new web development approach in Tridian, and what are some of the best practices we can talk about. And finally, we wrap up with the conclusion and my opinion. Moving forward, before we really jump into the Jamstack, let's talk about some of the um, some of the predictions, some of the thoughts that the industry leaders are having about Jamstack. So, in 2018, GitHub's co-founder Tom he predicted that in the next five years you will be building your next enterprise application with the Jamstack and deploy it onto the Netlify. We are just three years in the in the line, and we are already talking about. So I see it is a really good prediction by Tom. Um, another industry leader, Glamo, who is a CEO of Warsal, and uh, we know him better as a co-creator of the Next of JS, has mentioned on one of the JS uh, party podcast that Jamstack will be bigger than Node.js. In my opinion, this is a really big statement. And uh, I hope this introduced some of the some of the butterfly in your stomach about this new web development approach. Let's see what it is. So Jamstack, when we talk about, um, it's not a technology. It's uh, not another JavaScript framework. It's not a coding platform. Jamstack is just a new web development approach, giving a lots of wing to the developer doing their innovations to the to the nth level. So when we talk about JAM, uh, it stands for the JavaScript APIs and markup. And we combine them together to, to create a new development approach. What happens in this, um, typically the business logics, various hefty tasks are outsourced to, to the third party utilities, to the uh, custom APIs, microservices. And the HTML CSS markups that has been pre-compiled before the deployment and usually served over the CDN for a faster and efficient uh, customer experience. If I see it, compare it from the traditional um, web, web 1.0 where most of the things are static and the new web 2.0 approaches, I feel Jamstack is actually combining the both of the, both of them. So we get the static experience, which is very fast, very efficient. Also, the, the dynamicity of the web 2.0 is combined into one single approach. So if I ask um, a, a website which is using Jamstack approach, is it going to be a static website or is it going to be a dynamic website? 
in my opinion, it's neither a static website, it's nor a dynamic website. Typically, it is a dynamically generated static website, and all this would be controlled through an automated build process. We will see how that works in a bit. But yeah, this is how it is like not a static, not dynamic, just a static website generated dynamically. High level, very high level, uh, how it works. So you see, like we have the static files, like all our HTMLs and the style elements in it. We have all the data repositories. It could be CMS, it could be databases, it could be some cloud services, or it could be a typical third party API. We have all our build processes combined all together and generate um, dynamically generate by fetching all these informations and uh, static information together and bunch it into a dynamically generated static file set. So the whole site is all the generated dynamically fetching up data from different data repository. But now it is a bunch of a static file which usually get deployed onto a CDN and uh, the users typically access that for a faster performance uh, from the from the CDN. So ideally, these CDNs would be serving the content, and there would be some some of the logic we have to implement, or you know, there are some already inbuilt as well for refreshing those CDNs whenever there is a change in the content. If I see how our Jamstack is different from the traditional web. So let's talk about the traditional web. What happens in it? You usually the client request for a URL, which uh, results to a web server. Web server usually utilize the app servers for various business logic and algorithm executions and fetch interacts with the databases, CMSs, third party applications, and combine a response, which will be um, thrown back to the client through the web server. So that's how most of us have been uh, doing the development since ages. What Jamstack is doing, our client is fetching up most of the, most of the website from the CDN in a very fast static way. And then there would be integration utilizing the J, the JavaScript of the Jam uh, and the A API of the Jam combined together, like microservices and APIs combined together to uh, the JavaScript, um, giving you a dynamic experience. And these Microsoft, uh, sorry, microservices and APIs could be interacting behind the scene with a uh, lots of data repository. So these JavaScript could be could be any any plain JavaScript, Ajax, or some advanced uh, framework like React or Vue.js or anything like that, whatever you think about. Another view of traditional web versus the Jamstack. So in traditional web, you see like the request and response have been driven on the HTTPS to the web server. And now this web server is solely responsible for doing activities, for example, like authentication, search, payments, commerce, similar to that. And then the response has been generated at the web server, returned it back to the HTTPS. That's what happened onto the traditional web app. In Jamstack web application, what happens, your web server is very, very thin. You basically get an APIs, or you can completely have a completely serverless uh, setup where, you, are, uh, where you, you have your static site onto the CDN and your uh, um, task, your algorithm, your business logics have been delegated to a specialized API. So you can have the Auto for the authentication, Elasticsearch for the search, Stripe for the payment, Salesforce, Commerce Cloud for the commerce, and all that information is being, you know, uh, taken up by the JavaScript of the J by utilizing this API architecture. Benefits, if we talk about, um, if we combine all this information together, your uh, front server that is being uh, exposed to the, you know, to the public world is just contain the static information most of the time. So it gives you a high security, even if somebody get into that public server, they're just getting the static site, nothing much. And since mo one of the best practices utilizing in Jamstack is uh, utilizing the CDN, 
most of your things should be uh, on the CDN. So it would give a blazing fast user experience. Similarly, it gives a lots of developer friendly options because developers uh, don't really need to worry a lot about the about a specific technology, about a specific uh, you know restriction or boundaries. They they will be totally free to do whatever innovation they want. Uh, portability and scalability, that's quite obvious if you can see because the things are totally decoupled. You can uh, do the portable uh, portability of one part of your entire ecosystem without affecting the others. Uh, same Similar is the case with the scalability. You can totally scale it out to the nth level. Um, the co-founder of Netlify, uh, Matthias Bellman and Phil Hawksworth, They've written a book called Modern Web Development onto the Jamstack, uh, published by O'Reilly. And they said, like, the Jamstack dramatically reduces the financial cost of building and maintaining websites and applications, increases team efficiency, and lowers the boundaries to the innovation. So from some industry leader, these kind of benefits mentioned in a written book uh, is a really, really, really good benefit to the Jamstack community. When talking about the benefits, uh, there also comes up some of the disadvantages. So as we clearly see, um, there, there would be a lot of dependencies onto the IT infrastructure and the developer team uh, to do even some of the small work. Content refresh, um, since it is all static served through the CDN, you are advised to implement um, some logic to, to refresh that or invalidate that cache so that the updated content can be can be can be delivered and uh, by default if we see the content editor friendliness would not be there however we can we can implement some of the customizations but yeah that is one of the big disadvantage uh, from the content editor perspective and certainly all this um, summarized to one of the thing that is longer time to market so Despite of a lot of advantages we can see with Jamstack, it had a spectacular rise, but uh, it certainly need to address few of the critical concerns related to the dependency on the IT, longer time to market, and content friendliness, content editor friendliness. We talk about the Tridian. Uh, where does Jamstack fits in? So when we talk about Tridian sites 9.5, by design, it, it highlights a good headless CMS uh, capabilities. And most of the contents can be accessed in, in a JSON format through, through various APIs. This certainly makes a great case of using the uh, or utilizing the headless features of Gradient Sites 9.5 and coupled, coupled with the Jamstack's web development approach to have an awesome experience delivered to the customer. So, Another advantage that would happen up, uh, why you would be you know, choosing, one key reason could be you may want to go as serverless as possible by utilizing Jamstack with Tridian. So if you see on the right side on the slide, um, a typical use case scenario, very, very much example here, a client application would be there, uh, could be React, could be Vue.js, could be plain JavaScript, Ajax. It would be interacting with the headless feature through the APIs of Tridian to fetch the data in the uh, JSON format. You can also delegate your authentication processes to third parties like AuthO and utilize their open ID based authentication API to perform your authentication. You can utilize the Elasticsearch uh, search API, which is a RESTful, and implement your search effectively or you can have a Salesforce Commerce Cloud integration utilizing its Shopper product API, for example, which is again a RESTful, and get all those information to you know, have a enriched uh, client application served through a CDN. Um, we talk about some of the best practices uh, when we are applying Jamstack to the Tridian. Um, it's recommended if we can make maximum possible use of the CDN. Another thing, um, one of the challenges that happens with any Jamstack website, since most of the caching is there, since most of the CDN uh, play would be there, a big challenge comes up in invalidating that cache. Tridian 
on the other hand provides a really great case because the publishing process in Tridian is highly extensible. For example, you can write up a very small deployer extension which allows you to clear up all the cache including CDNs um, through the deployer extension as soon as your publishing is successful. And if it has failed, you don't do anything. So that kind of a extension really provides a great value add to the Tridian and Jam stack. Um, another best practice, we choose to generate um, a static site with various ways, but it is highly recommended in Jamstack to utilize some modern static site generator tools like Gatsby, Hugo, and Next. Um, and uh, the deployments also, site generation and deployment builds, it is highly recommended to be automated rather than the, uh, the manual ones to get the best, uh, best out of the Jamstack. Another challenge and a very common mess with the Jamstack. Um, see, one of the problem happen up, Jamstack deployment uh, keeps growing exponentially on the addition of the, you know, the whole um, multiple features basically. So if you choose to have like a full build every time, after some time, uh, an year down the line, um, your, your, your builds or deployment becomes become really huge becomes really unmanageable so it's always recommended in a jamstack scenario to have the atomic deployments for a specific feature or for a specific set of functionality uh, another best practice would be to make full use of git and the and the features in the git like git flow to maintain all your you know codes and the features completely isolated and you can have your git seamlessly integrated with with few of the tools static site generator tools and the deployment tool like netlify and having a direct deployment happening up from your git so there won't be any any hiccups in the into the deployment or the misses one more thing that uh, we missed out when we work with uh, complexity and having focuses onto the site generation onto the deployment onto the builds a very common thing that we missed out is the core web vitals. So follow all the best guidelines around the core web vitals, like the first content paint and uh, time to first byte, etc., so that your SEOs and related marketing features are not uh, getting hit. Um, these are a few of the best practices. There could be a little bit more, but just in the uh, interest of the time. Uh, I'm moving on to the conclusion. So in my opinion, Jamstack, could be a great fit or could be a misfit. Uh, it totally depends on your business needs, your priorities, and uh, the audience of the system. So for example, your huge case is that um, your marketing team is gonna frequently launch some uh, landing pages every then and now, and uh, they need like uh, totally free hand without much dependency onto the IT. Jamstack is not for that particular scenario. But if you think about some, uh, uh, I mean, high performance uh, requirement or security requirement or some use case scenario where you wanted to have like product documentations, Jamstack would be a great fit. I can give like two uh, real world example you can check out after this lighting talk. So Citrix uh, product uh, documentation uh, website and uh, Postman's uh, learning uh, documentations. They both are powered by Jamstack and the kind of the experience it is providing for searching uh, a specific uh, documentation I'm looking or the experience of the fastness of searching like tons of documentation, it's really awesome. So you can look for those Citrix uh, product documentations or Postman's learning documentation. They are really providing great, awesome experience powered by Jamstack. Uh, in a nutshell, if I talk about Jamstack, it gives a great advantage in terms of the performance, security, scalability, efficiencies, and on top of it, a huge financial saving onto the infrastructure sites. Yet, uh, it is still uh, uh, requires a lot of work, uh, need to become a more mature for big, big enterprise solutions. So that's pretty much uh, my uh, presentation lightning talk about Jamstack. I would be happy to answer the questions into the chat as we discussed. I am handing over it to Velu. I hope his mic issues are resolved. Yeah, thank you, Pankaj. Uh, 
let me start my uh, presentation and uh, now i can hey welcome everyone uh, welcome to nasa trillion expert summit and joining the second day of the sessions uh, what i want to talk about today for trillion purpose of deploy performance fine tuning about some common problems and and solution to solve those problems by adjusting different configurations uh, especially for some specific content delivery implementation and depends on the specific requirements and settings of the projects uh, my name is uh, Vilmur Ganachanan, and in, in short, uh, most of you know known by Velu. I'm a senior solution architect at AWS and professional services MIA, and I have been uh, four years uh, and based on uh, uh, Amsterdam. Um, in background, I have 16 years of experience in Trillion Sites, and I'm active at Trillion Sites MEP and Trillion Export, and, and more active in Trillion Stack Exchange. You can see me a lot. And the agenda, we're going to talk about quickly on the common publishing problems and solution and Q&A if you have, uh, you can post a question in this chat window. Uh, we can look at the common uh, publishing problems. Uh, yeah, many factors can impact the publishing for problems, but this is happening because of uh, certain things like uh, happening long running transactions, or if you customize uh, uh, something or it takes some, uh, uh, content deploy by adding custom modules or processing or deploy maybe be uh, slow down noticeably, especially when this customization interact with the backend system. Or if you have a requirement, uh, something for mass publishing, and it's not uh, properly configured, uh, that could also cause issues with the deadlock. Or sometime if you have a number of scaled up servers, uh, CPU, and you are not properly configured, you are rendering and deploying threat. Uh, against your CPU code, and that can also uh, uh, cause issues with the deadlock. Uh, so we will going to see uh, uh, how we're going to solve those uh, problems uh, by looking at the solution. I can quickly walk through some of the uh, specific configuration. Why? Because we are looking at common publishing problem, because I have seen many stack exchange, even customer implementation, and most of uh, uh, customers, uh, they are not uh, fine tuning their configuration. They use it always out of the box. It can work in the specific low publishing configuration, everything. Uh, but in, when it comes to uh, uh, mass publishing and they want to have a scaled out setup and they miss to configure it. And that's why we want to keep this message and keep this configuration so that it can be easily accessed and, and it should be able to fixable. Looking at the solution by quickly. And then first, before you look at that, uh, the, the, the typical, uh, the publishing overview architecture, most of you know, this publishing is the process of getting the content out of the content manager through the content delivery environment onto the presentation environment. This is a more involves a lot of number of process and each will perform specific tasks. And we will look at it each of uh, uh, the service and, and, and what the configuration needs to be adjusted for in the publishing side and the publishing service and transport service and in the content deployer service. And maybe it could be some database, uh, uh, some things to adjust. Okay, let's look at the publisher so, uh, so uh, side. There is some important point, uh, things we need to uh, understand in the number of uh, the threads for deploying. Uh, this would be approximately you should twice the number of CPU code as the number of rendering threads and the same number of uh, codes or transporting threads. If more threads are used, you typically know significant performance, it's gain is achieved. But instead, it's better to scale out the publisher server. Even if you scale out publisher server, you could do it like a two to four instance in order to get optimal performance and scaling out more than four uh, puppies are certainly limited to uh, yeah, you know, performance gain achieved. It, it mostly due to the limitation on the database transaction in the number of permitted IO operations. So that's why it's all, it's all dependent, right? It all depends on the, whether the, yeah, the, it's it's a it's a publisher running in the uh, separate machine or running alongside the other services. So these are the things. So, but this is an important rule. So if you have, for example, if you have a two, uh, four CPU code, and better you can configure a number of threads deploying for four, and then the number of uh, uh, number of threads for rendering is eight, and you can adjust and fine tune it, play around, and make sure that you're not getting into the uh, uh, the deadlock issue. You can you can adjust and play around. Next, to look at the, the transport service uh, uh, mainly if it, if, because it's important things. Uh, when you are testing your, your thread in the publisher, num, publisher thread and the rendering thread, and that's also has some dependence with the worker thread configuration because this is needs to ensure that 
because the transfer processes tracks more packages at the time. But most of the time, it's a default. It's value set in the in the five worker threads. This can be increased based on the increase on the publisher thread. This can yeah, this can you could increase between uh, ten to fifteen per position to increase in the number of publisher thread. That you always needs to refer to the number what you have been increased or kept the configured. So note this is yeah, in this, it, it's too far. The transfer service will create an extensive number of HTTP threads. So that's that's keep yeah, keep note of that. And then and look at the other other configuration, which is a uh, send timeout for package, uh, because uh, this is mostly for uh, by default it's one minute. Uh, this this should not be English very high value. It could go for English five minutes, otherwise it can lead uh, some deadlock of publishing will become slow. Yeah, uh, slow and essentially it get blocked. Uh, so maximum value should not exceed uh, more than eight minutes. So. So these are the uh, these are the recommended values where you could uh, set it up and, and adjust what uh, timeout settings. And now look at that. Now we have looked at all in the uh, publisher side. Now we are looking at in the deployer side. So now your deploy package has been delivered, and you can look at the different components pieces in the typical uh, setup. Uh, so for a couple of uh, customers, we did uh, some configuration. That's what I want to share. And, and what is important for hardware, you need to uh, you need to prepare your hardware requirements. And it's uh, it's up to some customer. They have scaled out setup. They can go for uh, uh, storing in the uh, uh, work of yeah deploy work uh, deploy uh, deploy thumb point or something. They can go for deploy and worker as a scaled out setup with uh, Redis. But you should mainly you need to think about the Redis. This has some some kind of limitation in the storage. Uh, so when you, before you decide, and you, you can think about the storage. Maybe sometime you're publishing the big package by sex group publishing, so the big package will end up, so you will not be able to use it. So uh, then, uh, that maybe you need to think about whether you use it or not. But more, mainly, most of my my com implementation we did for final storage file system, queue in file system, and it, it works perfect. That's what I'm going to show you what what we can and. Uh, now the next one you can think about your uh, deploy your hardware requirements. Uh, this is mainly for uh, uh, to the two requirements like a CPU and memory, but also for iWork accessibility because most of the package is actually writing in the file system extract and do something like this. And and, and mostly if you're looking at uh, uh, pulp publishing requirements, we always recommend to have high memory powers needed because it allows the system to process uh, uh, pulp mass publishing and so it's, uh, it's always need more uh, IO performance largely in front of the system speed so uh, so have we advice uh, to how to advise to uh, increase at least for uh, deploy server memory to 32 GP for best results uh, we can go into say tell you uh, and then where you can use if you go for 32 GP and you might need to allocate a certain uh, uh, memory to a JVM so I'm going to talk about the next slide and you can look at here. So there's one of the things in the deploy upload limit. Uh, so you also need to adjust. Uh, don't forget that because uh, sometimes if you uh, uh, have a big uh, packages, uh, in, uh, maybe a default some configuration that you always need to adjust what for requirement uh, based on your package size or implementation. Sometimes you have uh, your content model have a lot of images. You can use it, and along with always configure and adjust for JVM memory uh, for copies collection settings to be optimal uh, in the in the chart or maybe if it's java.net adjust uh, according to the file and in general advice as i mentioned in the previous one if you're going for 30 gp memory server with allocate 20 gp dedicated to a deploy a JVM memory it works best result uh, we have seen it so it's it's uh, it works for that so at uh, the next uh, uh, configuration in the deploy service you can look at it there is a configuration of deploy workers for queues this mostly it's a default value so 10 and in most scenario this value is sufficient you should not be increased because increasing higher value may result in potential state lock at database level since you have the time mechanism implemented by this state lock and decrease the performance of the deployer right so it's better yeah keep it or you need to find donate and adjust your memory and, and things and then you need to play around so this is uh, yeah this is most of the case yeah the number of workers should not be set up too high there will be limit because of the database transaction mechanism can cope with because the size, the number of connections, and then so yeah, uh, certain things needs to be adjusted according to that. And the, the next one, if you can look at deploy your database full configuration, because if you're increasing that the worker threads, you also need to adjust for uh, uh, database uh, pool size for connection size 
uh, number of how many connections you can uh, because the default there are certain numbers but you need to think about your requirements you need to fine tune it uh, that exercise um, so then you can access to it uh, with this and then always need to have this validation query parameters but nowadays yeah out of the box uh, those parameters by default is available and part of uh, our deploy extension if you are using still in the previous version maybe it's, you missed out it's not there so always recommend to use this validation query parameter in conjunction with the test and power parameter it's recommended to use in any scenario uh, as i mentioned the size uh, it's, it's always uh, it's a minimum number of ideal connection involved this must be greater than the number of worker configured in the previous uh, config i mentioned it increasing this number can be shown to be effective in increasing the throughput so i have uh, two uh, configuration this one for uh, this is for uh, microsoft sql and this is for oracle uh, if you configure the uh, the size and the validation query so looking at the the the, uh, the next uh, configuration for now we look at on the broker database where we have a deploy service uh, we also now we still need to configure the same thing for uh, our state store database so there you could also add these parameters uh, for uh, microsoft sql or if it is for oracle you can you can configure these properties for it it's, you can use for any uh, any any scenario with the uh, transaction with that and then uh, the another uh, one is important one to note it uh, because this is also now uh, it was not there in the 8.5 but now there's a release a hotfix but now it's part of uh, uh, the latest versions uh, it, it's uh, it's by, by default there so there's no need for any hotfix anything uh, sometimes we are not handling properly uh, for stopping the deployer so we are sometimes oh, publishing is uh, broken and we we, some, we suddenly go and 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 restart the deployer and in between and there is a record in, in, in some uh, transaction in progress is stopped and, and, and slipped over and that's also leading some deadlock issues so nobody doesn't know what is causing but that's that's what we have a mechanism clean up the state store if there are any records left over it's not been deleted it's failed record it could be sometime intermittently stopped and you can configure that state store cleanup property in the application property file. Which, uh, so that can take care of uh, some, you could also configure it by hey, daily, uh, daily night or weekly once so or sometime specific date. You could configure it uh, uh, some specific uh, uh, time to schedule time to take care of it. And it's also one of the important things you need to set up this in the Microsoft SQL uh, for this uh, recommend to set. This is mainly needed for uh, prevent the deadlock. So all the database for set allows snapshot isolation. This is important for uh, setting up this in the uh, state store database. Uh, don't forget about that. And the uh, and the one more to the last uh, uh, configuration for the deploy service uh, uh, for the there is a configuration for taxonomy count. It's always by default enabled. And, and and most of the time uh, we are not using that because th there is always uh, in the backend it's actually making a count and if you think about that if you maybe you're not using these apis you can disable it it's, it's maybe it's also improve a performance and publishing and, and stuff like this but as far as i know this actually uh, use when you are on txa taxonomy uh, based navigation it could be used because for come those kind of functionality uh, but you can yeah you can think about implementation if you are using it or not and based on that if you're not using these apis and better advice to disable it so this also improve your performance so and will deploy side and uh, and then most of the problem i talk about stopping in between the deploy how can i handle that i don't want to be get in between stop it but there is a certain position to gradually you could shut down the environment for content delivery environment so there is a api rnd provider for shut down the content delivery environment gradually if you want to deactivate the environment for maintenance reason in practice this means the publisher does not pick up any new publishing actions in the publishing queue directed in the environment which it means it reminds in the publishing queue until the environment is reactivated so you can disable it so so that even if you have thousand items published in the publishing queue you don't need to republish it again you even never go to failed item it will stay it's a frozen state now you go and make sure that your deployer doesn't have any commit transaction anything make sure that get everything and then finish uh uh uh, uh and check there is no trans there is no in progress item then you stop it do a maintenance task and then enable it back so that in the in progress in the in the published queue you push some some maybe thousand items it will continue working so you don't need to push it back 
it's still in the queue it will continue to process it so that's that's uh, one of the uh, important command you can use for maintenance mostly to avoid but don't stop immediately for deployer keeping in, in properly to this command to shut down the environment and my uh, last uh, slide, so not least, so uh, just quickly give you the, some recommendations. So uh, look at do a planning and testing in the deploy. Uh, so do a deploy performance fine tuning exercise in the beginning. Most of the customer where they lacking or uh, missing it. Hey, they never do any publishing. They always do development testing and upgrade. They come in the last minute in the production, and that's where they start publishing before go live last two days before, and they're getting into fallback, and they're getting into a lot of issues, uh, and then they feel like, oh, this my deployer is not there, and then they really didn't know about different configuration need to adjust in order to get to a deployer to be stable. So that's why I'm recommending planning and testing, make sure the two exercises in the beginning, include performance testing early, plan with, publishing activities in advance and measure some publishing volume roughly 500 items per hour it could be reasonable performance goals to pursue so that your performance is stable there's no uh, there's no so you access to all the settings before i mentioned and this of course is recommended run your content deployers separate server uh, and then run it with combining with your deployer web server and txc service can come for performance i introduced this sometime I can see some customer they running everything in the same box. Uh, uh, sometimes maybe uh, other services consuming more memory because then you're also doing some pulp publishing. It's causing a lot of performance and also introducing risk. So better recommended to run your deployers a dedicated uh, server. And then of course you could also use uh, some uh, database uh, user to restrict to have content service. Uh, hey, you could have a special user read only uh, read only user especially for accessing broker database to use it in the content content service because that's mainly reading uh, data right or you could pick up the same database in the back end also writing or publishing you could also dedicate a uh, dedicated user by read write you could also differentiate it can give allow you to get some uh, a number of connection thing report how much how much connection using by my deployer how much connection using by content service and you can easily identify and get some troubleshooting things if you really need it so last uh, my other advice to update what deployed the latest hotfix uh, although it's not met may not be required but unless it's specifically yeah uh, specified or it's required so you could uh, you could use it uh, yeah this is what i would like to uh, present it today and then thank you for joining this session have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the session and thank you all and if you have any questions uh, and 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 uh, keep it in the uh, question chat box and uh, yeah we will uh, answer you thank you all